Can you all hear me? There we are. Uh, I usually have at least one to two microphone mishaps per sermon, and so having just spoken too early and then almost dropping it, I think we might be good for the rest of the rest of our time here. Uh, what, good morning once again. My name is Derek Rishmaui. I am the campus minister with RUF at UC Irvine, and it's a great privilege to be here with you uh, this morning to share out of God's word. I've heard uh, great things about this congregation from Jonathan Keenan, who's a colleague of mine who works at UC Santa Barbara. And so I was really excited to be able to come and share out of God's word with you this morning. Uh, having talked to uh, Pastor Ron and, and um, got the okay from the elders, which thank you, elders. Um, before we get into things, however, I, I want to begin simply uh, by praying to the Lord, asking for his help and presence in this time, and then we're going to turn to read out of God's word in Isaiah chapter 6. If you want to turn in your Bibles there, um, we're going to open with prayer, however, and then we'll, we'll move on. Holy Father, you are good and holy and true, and you are the author of all truth. Uh, All truth that we receive is derivative of your own self, God. You are the Lord of reality. And when we come into contact with it, when we understand it more, we are understanding you. We pray right now that in this time as you, we read and teach and receive from your word that you yourself would give yourself to us in it. Help us to receive who you are and what you've done for us in such a way that is is not just a dead letter, a dead word, but it's actually a transformative fire that purifies us from within and lights us up and transforms us and transfigures us more and more into the image of your precious son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Again, our text this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 6. It is, in fact, the whole chapter. So read along with me. Hear now the reading of God's word. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, With two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. And he said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their hearts, their ears heavy and blind their eyes. lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste and the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land and though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. This is the word of the Lord. So uh, famed novelist Cormac McCarthy passed away, I believe, last year. And he's known for many texts. Some of you might have read them, uh, Blood Meridian, No Country for Old Men. Uh, But most famously for his post-apocalyptic novel, 
The Road, which was adapted into a film starring Viggo Mortensen, in case you've seen it. There a couple of these have been films. Uh, in any case, um, the, the Road tells the story of a man and his son. They live in a blighted and destroyed world after a sort of unspecified apocalyptic event uh, where almost all vestiges of society have just crumbled. It's collapsed. The sky is darkened and there's, there's, no, there's no social order to speak of. And in this world, the question... Um, that's raised is one, uh, an author, Alan Noble, he's written on the, on the work, he's got another book called On Getting Out of Bed, but he, he talks about essentially the, the, the question that opens up this work that, that, that suffuses the whole is, why continue to live, right? Why continue to live? And this is, this is a question that can be answered in many ways in the book. The book has two main characters in it, the man and his boy, right? The man and the boy, and, and the man with his son, and they live, and in, in, in his, the, the, the story begins after the fact that, his wife has actually answered the question in one way already. She's, she's ended her own life, and all that's left is the man and his boy. And what you're, st what you're starting to see here is that the man has chosen to live and has to live in such a way that he confers meaning upon life for the sake of his son, right? He's determined to raise his son, to protect him to give him the will to live and instruct him in the way in the face of a world that has been destroyed. He tells them they have to carry the fire, right? Because they're the good guys and their choices are meaningful. And day by day, they have to get up and move on and live in the face of a blighted landscape. And this is what this man must do. He must do things. He must get up. He must eat. He must sleep. He must do it all over again for the sake of this boy. I bring this up because in many ways, the vision of Isaiah 6 provokes similar questions. How do you minister? How do you live before God? How do you proclaim the word of the Lord? How do you go about faithfully following the Lord in the face of a sure and certain apocalypse? a catastrophe that threatens to undo the future of everything you hold dear. This is the question that Isaiah will face. And this is a question that I, it's not just faced by Isaiah. It's a, face, it's a question that we all have to face at some point, right? A lot of us have faced a crisis of meaning over the last few years. Much about our world has seemed in crisis. I don't know when you want to draw the line if you just want to go back a few years to the pandemic and the shutdowns and, and basically the social order with empty streets and empty highways, and empty schools, and empty churches, and empty, an empty landscape, right? It seemed like the whole world shut down. And the cascading effects that that had on our society and culture with wars and rumors of wars, societal unrest, neighbor against neighbor. All this taking place and unfolding broadcasts in, an, in a news media ecosystem seemed poised with its particular dynamics to exacerbate and polarize and metastasize the social conflict, right? We live and have lived for a while now in a, in a society that seems, at least on the surface, increasingly unstable. We live in a world order such that basic categories of right and wrong, basic categories of biology are no longer taken for granted in our world. That seems to be a world with a crisis of meaning on the horizon. It's not just the social, big, large, global crisis of meaning. It's, it's also the small scale ones, right? It's the, it's the job loss. It's the medical diagnosis that you weren't expecting to get in your annual checkup. It's, 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 the phone call from school. It's the trouble with your child. It's the trouble with your career. It's the trouble with the marriage that you thought was going to make it. And suddenly there's this big black cloud on the horizon on all of these things. These small scale apocalypses, these small scale catastrophes can shatter meaning just as easily as the large scale ones, if not more. The question becomes, how do you remain faithful on that day? in the face of that vision? How do you claim to follow God? How do you submit to him? How do you not just collapse in fear or retreat or throw up your fist in anger and rage and rebellion? Because here's the thing, 
unless you have an answer that will sustain you on that kind of day, you don't really have an answer on the sunny days. Right? The sunny day is what's sustaining you. No, unless you have an answer to the crisis of meaning on the day it actually comes, where everything seems black, when you can't see what's coming forward, and you don't actually know how to follow him now, in the present. So what I want to do this morning to, 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 to wrestle with this, this question of how do you follow Jesus, as it were, in the face of the apocalypse, I want to look at what, G, what Isaiah saw. Uh, I want to uh, look at this vision that we have in Isaiah 6, and what I want to do is uh, I want to look at four things. We're going we're gonna to look at first, first uh, the, the basic fact that the end is coming. Second, God is holy. Third, you are not. Fourth, the seed is in the stump. Right? And under those four headings, we're going to unfold this text, but we're going to begin, uh, as it were, at the end. The end is coming. So this whole passage is what might be called a commissioning vision. It's, it's an event that's basically the call of the prophet Isaiah. Now, Isaiah was a prophet in the late 8th century during the reign of several kings, Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And our vision, as we'll get into, was during the reign of, uh, or at the end of the reign of Uzziah, the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. And the backdrop to this vision is twofold, right? First, externally, we have the threat of the invasion of the then dominant kingdom of Assyria, right? And this is, this is coming, this is on the horizon, and this is a problem, right? Because Assyria is massive and Israel's not. More importantly, however, there's not just a threat coming externally, there's a threat internally. And internally, the problem is that the, the kingdom of Judah is ripe for judgment. It is wicked, right? You look at the first few chapters and you realize that at the time, God's people are full of malice. They shed blood. They oppress the poor. They commit idolatry. They commit sexual immorality. They lie. They dishonor the Sabbath. They they engage in syncretistic, hypocritical worship of the one God, right? They deserve what's coming, as it were. So what does God decree for Isaiah's ministry when he calls him? When he calls Isaiah, he sends him out as a prophet to declare his word. But what is the word? It's a word of judgment. And not just any judgment. It's a judgment about the people's response to Isaiah's ministry and what will become of them as a result. And, and, and here, here's the interesting thing. He says, first, God has declared that as a punishment for their refusal to listen, for their refusal to hear over and over again the prophets that God has sent in the past, their judgment is that they will continue to not hear. They will continue to be deaf. They will continue to be blind to what God has put in front of them. Their hearts will become heavy. They won't turn. God's punishment for sin, in this case, is in fact more sin. And this is actually something to just consider as a side note here. Many of us often think that God's judgments are the lightning bolt that comes down from heaven that strikes you in the middle of your sin. In fact, sometimes his worst judgment, according to Romans 1, is when God just hands you over to keep doing whatever it is that you're doing that leads to death. So if you are currently walking in sin... And the fact that God hasn't stopped you externally right now leads you to think that nothing's coming. That actually might be the thing that ought to make you most fearful and repent. Second, however, how, does this, how long will this blindness permit, persist? How long does this sin lead to more sin? Well, until cities lie in waste. Until their sin, their folly, and their evil will persist until God brings further judgment upon them. Not with the Assyrians. God will save them from the Assyrians. But eventually, the Babylonians will rise up and destroy them and carry them off into exile. And this will come. And they will be devastated and destroyed. And Jerusalem will be no more. And now get what this means for Isaiah. Right? God has decreed for his ministry. Like what will make Isaiah's ministry a success? If everything he loves, everything he holds dear, everything that he's given himself for, all, all that he's grown up around, if all that lies destroyed. People have this idea that prophets 
hate Israel, right? This is not the case. The prophets love Israel. Isaiah was a Hebrew nationalist, as it were. He loved his people. He loved his nation. And yet, for God's call on his life to succeed, what Isaiah's coming to learn and what he will learn is that all that he has ever loved will lie in ruins. Failure and pain, persistent preaching in the face of obstinacy, right? I, and, and here's the thing, Isaiah does it, right? Isaiah says, here I am, let me go, Lord. And he does it, rain or, cold, rain or shine, wind or cold. He preaches, he writes, he walks around naked for years as a sign act. And at the end of things, church tradition has it that he's, he's murdered, sawn in two. This is his reward for his faithfulness. The question becomes then, what does God show him that prepares him for such a call? What does God give him a vision of that allows him to endure and persist in the face of the catastrophe that threatens to undo both his social and personal worlds? At the end of the day, what God gives him is a vision of himself, the king. Right? And it's that vision I want to devote a little bit of time. What did Isaiah see? What did he learn about God on that day? Uh, several points can be made, but I'm going to quickly make a few. The first thing that he saw is simply that God is the king. Now, how do we know that? Well, he says, my, Lord, my eyes have seen the king. Uh, but more importantly, though, we see everything in this vision communicates the majesty and glory of God. What, is, what do we see? God seated high and exalted on a throne in the temple, in the tabernacle, right? The temple. What is the temple? The temple is not just a spiritual house where people go to worship. The temple was actually the throne, the palace, and the Holy of Holies was the throne room of the king of kings, of the whole cosmos. That's why it's tricked out in gold and there's incense and, 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 and there's uh, functionaries. It's the royal court of the king. And this isn't just any king. This is the transcendent king, right? Everything in this vision sets God apart from everything else. His size is immense, right? The train of his robe fills the temple. All you can see at the bottom, all, all Isaiah can see is essentially the nub of God's toe. Because the height differential the expanse, and this is just imagery to communicate the infinite immensity of the Lord God. There is no size scale that makes sense for him. As Solomon prayed at the dedication of the temple, the Lord cannot be contained even within the highest heavens. Second, he sees the seraphim. What are the seraphim? Well, these are these um, the angels, and I, I don't have that time to make the argument for it, but what you should basically imagine are these terrifying, flaming, dragon-like creatures with six wings who, if you saw them, you would evacuate your bowels because of the horror that you'd experience. I'm not, I'm not kidding. This is, this, is, this is flaming terror. And here's the thing about those dragons, those flaming angels. They're covering their eyes. They're hiding their eyes from beholding the flaming purity and majesty and glory of this king so that they don't get their eye sockets blown out. And this brings us to understanding what kind of a vision this is. Essentially, this is a contrast vision. Remember, when was this? There's this little time stamp at the beginning. In the year that King Uzziah died. That's not just a throwaway time note. Right? Who was King Uzziah? King Uzziah was, for the most part, a decent king in Judah who ruled for about 52 years. And if you think about it, he was a cultural touchstone within Israel. Uh, queen Elizabeth uh, just passed about a year, year or so ago, 70-something years. Right? There are people who lived and died in her reign right? Uh, Queen Elizabeth has always been on the throne and she will always be on the throne as it were. That was King Isaiah. And what is, what happens to King Isaiah? King Isaiah doesn't just die. King Isaiah dies cursed, right? We read about this. He dies because he goes in and during the height of his reign, he, he arrogates to himself uh, the, the, the right to go in and offer incense within the temple and he does it wrong. And so God strikes him down with leprosy, which is essentially visible, um, 
It's death made visible on the flesh, symbolically. He lives, he lives out his days as a zombie, cursed, decrepit, decaying. All of this is meant to be called to mind as Isaiah sees the king on the throne who dwells there forever, unchanging, unfa- unfading, unchallengeable, because he is immutable and transcendent and high above all things. He is God only wise. And when John the Revelator sees a vision of God on the throne hundreds of years later, he hears the same song being sung about him, holy, holy, holy. The king's still sitting down. Now all of this goes into what it means for us to understand what it is for God to be holy. To be holy, to be the king, is for God to be unique and singular and set apart and transcendent and above all created realities. All power is his, all might is his, all sovereignty is his. And this is crucial for you to see. This is crucial for Isaiah to see in the middle of the crisis in your life. Because there comes those times where we're in the middle of the crisis and the question of obedience comes up. And you don't really know why because there's no, it doesn't seem like there's a positive good thing coming for you on the horizon. At the end of the day, it's good to just know it's good to follow him. Why? Because he's, he's the king. He's the creator. You just owe him your fealty. It is just right. Sometimes it needs to go no further than the fact that the Lord is the Lord. The ruler who upholds and sustains the cosmos and who created you and put the very oxygen in your lungs. And sometimes that's all you need to get you out of bed. It's like a shock of electricity to the system. Second though, this is also a reason for hope. Because at the end of the day, when everything around Isaiah was falling apart, even when good King Uzziah was dying and the things that were stable and secure were passing away, it's a reminder that the true king is always on the throne and in control who transcends time and history and all the threats that seem to come along the horizon. This is super important for us as Americans to know because oftentimes you and I measure our well-being and our hope on the basis of how much gas we have in the tank. Right. I'm an American. I, I, built my, I, I built my home. I built my business. I convinced my wife to marry me despite all odds. I, you know, like I, my, my know-how, my ingenuity, my, my capacity, whatever it is. And you feel like God is good and God is trustworthy as long as I know I can get the job done. Right? You give God about as much credit as you give yourself in the moment. Here's the thing. One day, the stock market's going to crash, and you don't control that. One day, you're going to get the diagnosis that you just don't have sovereignty over. You need hope that transcends your own finite limitations. You need hope that transcends all of the, all of the earthly material realities that we actually trust in day to day. This is the first thing that starts to sustain Isaiah. But... There's something else that Isaiah sees here, and this is the second point. You see, it's not only a contrast vision with the king that Isaiah saw. In the light of the revelation of the Lord, the king, Isaiah sees himself in a way that he had not potentially previously recognized. What does he say? He says, I am an unclean man among an unclean people. See, here's the thing. As a prophet with a background in the priesthood, it's very apparent that Isaiah saw the uncleanness of the people, both ritually and especially morally, right? Go back and read the first few chapters. And I'll say this. This is pretty typical. Uh, I, I, think, I think maybe the easiest part of the prophet's job, one that I think I could do myself, is just notice uh, the uncleanness of the people around me. I, I think you could all pretty much do this. We all do this every day, right? It's pretty easy to look around, give us us enough time, five minutes or five hours, and I can count up the sins, the injustices, the petty jealousies, the selfishness, the narcissism, the bad haircuts, the bad votes, the bad music taste, the bad whatever it is of the people around me, I'm pretty good at spotting that. And I'm good at spotting just enough to make myself feel pretty good. Right? I know I'm not perfect, but Ed, wow. (laughs) that guy, right? Comparatively, we can all look pretty clean. 
But this is essentially like two kids coming in, uh, coming home from, from playing out in the, in the yard. And, and what happens? You've got the one kid that fell in the mud pit and, and his brother comes and says, look, mama, I didn't fall in the mud. And then you turn on the fluorescent lights and what do you look like? Pig pen. You just got dust clouds all around him. And because he didn't fall in the mud and he's not soaked in it, he relatively, comparatively comes off looking righteous. But in the bright light of mom's fluorescence, what are you? You're dirty. You're unclean. And that's what Isaiah has stepped into, into the throne room of God. It's not the bright lights of the fluorescence. It is the shining, flaming glory of the moral purity of the God who doesn't just conform to a standard of righteousness, but is the eternal standard of righteousness, right? You don't, there's not like a standard of like, here's goodness and then here's God and he measures up. God is the standard. And when you come into the flame, when you come into the light, everything's exposed. All of our relative righteousness is shown up for what it is and he sees himself and he is undone. Have you ever come undone? Like, not, oh, woe is me. Smell the coffee. Oh, woe is me. I, I, think, I think I just blew up. I think I just blew up my marriage. Woe is me. I, I think I just blew up my job. Woe is me. I've destroyed my reputation. I've destroyed my children. I have, or I have seen something in myself in that moment where I said that thing, I, I uttered that phrase that I wanted, I, I was tempted to say, no, that's not really me. And then I start to realize, no, actually deep down, there's a, there's a streak of me that is me. And it's bigger and it's thicker and it's uglier than I ever would have admitted to myself before. That is the beginning of what coming undone means. And this is what it means to reckon with the issue of guilt. There's a philosopher, Merrill Westfall, he talks about guilt and he talks about the difference between your subjective felt sense of guilt and then objective guilt, which is essentially if there is a righteous standard according to which goodness is paid out with more goodness, like I deserve happiness on the basis of who I am and what I've done, objective guilt means you don't and subjective guilt means you come to realize it. Now, a lot of us have struggled with bad subjective guilt. You feel guilty about stuff you shouldn't because of, I don't know, trauma from your childhood or guilt or whatever it is. But there, there comes a day when you reckon up everything in the light of God's holiness and you come to see, no, if there is a good and truly holy God, given who I am, given the selfishness deep within me, I don't deserve to have good things from him. I deserve the opposite of those things from him. And this is what Isaiah sees and it breaks him. And it shows him what he is not. And this is significant, again, for that day. That day when the crisis comes. Because here's the thing. When you, when you walk into the middle of a crisis and you think you're righteous before God, that gives you a couple of options. Option one, uh, God, God failed me. Right? God failed me. God didn't come through. Or you think maybe I just got to work a little bit harder to kind of jog his memory, kind of kick in the righteousness and the merit that he owes me to pay out on it. And here's the thing, when you, when you start to do that, when you start to burn out and start to think, I've paid, I've owed, I've obeyed, and he's still not coming through, that option of hoping in him, that option of, the, of trusting in the payout goes away. And the only thing that's left is bitter anger and frustration and rage and raising your fist at him. And what that does is it actually alienates you again, from your only hope for salvation in that moment. It adds, it adds injury or insult to the injury of what you're already going through because it shuts the door of your heart against the one who would be your hope. So that, that is the second thing that Isaiah saw. 
says the power of God, he sees the purity of God, he sees himself in light of God, but that's not the only thing he saw. What else did he see? He saw his transcendence, he saw his purity, but he also saw his grace. And this is where we get to that back end, the, 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 the seed who is a stump, but we're really gonna start with the coal, right? Because what does he see? Sees the flaming coal. Remember, after Isaiah is undone, God sends a seraph with a coal from beneath the altar. And he uses it to apply this fire to Isaiah's lips and to burn away his sin, to atone for his sin. And what God does in that moment is he reveals himself not only to be a powerful God, not only to be a pure God, but he reveals himself to be a, a forgiving God who through that, in that moment, graciously burns away Isaiah's sin and actually sets him on fire and provokes him to go then live and speak a burning word from his own mouth. And it's the clearest sign of the graciousness of the God revealed on the, stro- on the throne, but that's not all. Recall the line at the end of the, of the prophecy, right? We've had this prophecy about how God is going to lay everything away. So there's going to be fire, there's going to be burning, there's all these things. But then you have this prophecy about a stump. But before we get to the stump, you have to understand the tree. See, the tree often represents Israel in the Old Testament. And in this case, the tree does. In in this case, it is burned by judgment down to the stump. But there is a seed in the stump, or rather, the stump is the seed. And that is the beginning of hope. See, later in Isaiah, there's a prophecy about a seed that comes from the line of Jesse. And this seed is going to become a king, a great king, an anointed king, a messiah, Jesus, through whom God would one day restore and renew and resurrect and regrow Israel and, in fact, all of the nations. Here's the paradox, though. How do seeds grow? Jesus tells us in John 12, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. See, unless the seed undergoes a death, it will not grow up again. Now, how does Jesus die? John tells us in the same chapter, John chapter 12, through the unbelief of the people. The people will one day reject Jesus as their Messiah, hate his message, turn on him, and have him crucified by the Romans, the Gentiles, the pagans. Here's what John says. Read this, verse 37. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the word of the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. For again Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. This is a marvel. John says that back in Isaiah 6, the Lord was prophesying and decreeing a judgment, not just about Israel then and there. In fact, it was a judgment about the people of Israel in the future when they were confronted, not just the message of Isaiah, but with the message of the one to whom he was pointing, the message of Jesus. And it was to him that they will turn a blind eye. And it was to him that they will turn a deaf ear. And it was to him against whom they will harden their heart and refuse to be healed. And it's because of that, it's by that very mechanism that he becomes the stump who is burned to the ground in the place of Israel. Right? Jesus comes as the true Israel. Jesus comes as the true seed. Jesus comes as the true tree. And in going to the cross, Jesus suffered the judgment that Israel's unbelief deserved. He faced the fire of God's judgment by being carried away and punished, judged by the Gentile nations. He was burned down to the stump. And yet, it's because of that judgment, because of that punishment that he suffered, he would become like a seed that goes into the ground dead, is buried, and yet rises again. And here we face an even greater irony and paradox, the irony of ironies. John says that Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Who did he see? The one on the throne, 
the one God of Israel who was the Lord himself, who one day became incarnate for us in the person of Jesus. See, the one who sent Isaiah on a mission to preach and to proclaim and be rejected and condemned and condemn Israel to death is the one who himself would come and proclaim and be rejected and be condemned as Israel himself in her place and for her salvation. Jesus, Jesus did not set Isaiah to walk down a road that he himself would not walk one day. And this is where, this is where you really get to, to see a picture of the unique, transcendent, incomparable majesty of the holiness of God revealed at one time in the judge who undergoes the judgment in our place for our salvation in order to redeem us. And that's what we see in the cross. All of God's power, all of God's purity, all of God's glory, all of God's mercy, all of God's justice, all of God's grace, all of it poured out and embodied in one pure moment for us and for our salvation. And when you start to understand that, when you understand the love and the mercy and the grace that Jesus endured, as it were, for you, that's when you start to get a sense of how you can face the apocalypse, right? And this is where I get to the, the, the title of the sermon. I've been kind of running on a little play on words. It kind of works, kind of doesn't. I've been using the term apocalypse in the common sense of, of a catastrophe, of the end of all things. But in the Greek, in the original language, apocalypse means revelation, unveiling. And so what, what we're looking at here today is essentially what Isaiah needed to face a vision of the end was a vision of the king, the true king, the gracious king, the beautiful king, the loving king, the king who rules and reigns and comes and dies and by dying rules and reigns for him and for us and for our salvation. And this is, this is what you have to see today. In those moments where it's black, in those moments where all you see is a cloud, like a tornado coming to just wipe everything you've held dear off the face of the map. You are not facing these things on your own. You're not even facing these things first. You're facing these things in the arms and in the protection and in the grace of your loving Savior who faced the ultimate collapse, who faced the ultimate apocalypse, who faced the ultimate end and will carry you through and out on the other side in his own resurrection. That, that is the comfort that we have in this text. It's not a coffee, coffee mug comfort. You slap on there with a little verse. It's, 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 it's the comfort that will sustain you to and through because it's been through the end itself. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Go ahead and bow your heads and pray with me. Holy Father, you are good and true and holy and righteous. You are the Lord. You are the Lord. You've gone through these things. You've suffered these things. You've overcome these things for us and our salvation. We pray to you right now in this time, in this place, that you would communicate this to our hearts in a way that will stick, in a way that will overcome all our fears and all our doubts and all our failures and all our blindnesses. Transform us by your grace. We pray all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.